Neil, UK Finance, advocates of training? Um, yeah, very much so. We, we're not a training company, but we have a huge uh, membership, um, primarily financial services firms. Uh, some are much larger than others, but they've got a, a real uh, strata of staff that go from very, very junior people all the way up to senior CEOs. Um, and our ethos is that we want these people to be on a learning journey through their career. So we offer everything from like breakfast briefings all the way up to partnering with the ICA on your postgraduate diplomas and we, and we try and get them to yeah. follow that through. And how, how are you finding that partnership? I know it's still quite early days. But yeah, it's, it's looking good. We're probably about 80% through building the framework. Now Excellent. we need to get it working. Very good, very good. And talking about learning journeys, you yourself have actually taken one or two of our qualifications, I think. Haven't you? One or two, yeah, um, <laughs> over the years. Um, it's, I'm a big believer in the continuous part of professional development. So, you know, you, you can do a course and that's great, but you shouldn't, I don't think you should just let it there. Yeah. You, you need to either continue learning or, e even better, continue learning and get to use what you've learned on the course in your day-to-day -day business because sure. being able to leverage that learning in your day-to-day -day experience this is how you build to expertise and that's what we're all striving for. And I think in the early days, the very first one, I, I don't think we had that many qualifications we were offering in those days, were we? It, I, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was three certificates and three diplomas. <laughs> and I did the three certificates and then I thought, I'm going to do the AML diploma. And then you started doing advanced certificates yes. and then it started to broaden out. Yeah. Um, and then obviously, must have been about 2016-ish, you brought in the postgrad diploma. Yes. Um, and that one looked really attractive and, and I have to say it was a really great course. It is amazing because today we're offering about, I think it's 40 qualifications, uh, 10 short courses. And I think it's very reflective of mm -hmm. the demand that's coming through from a lot of companies. There's a lot of specialisms and a need for practical training. So it's interesting. And the spin-off from the uh, qualification, the networking? Well, I think uh, two distinguished guests here today <laughs> definitely <laughs> prove that the networking aspect of the course is as important as the course itself, because the course is a point in time, yeah. but what you can take out of that course, th the ability to learn, di the disciplines that you get from doing study, you can continue to use, but the networking aspect is really important, and this is how I met Gloria and Marta. So it was literally we met on the course and we've kept in touch since and, and we use each other for expertise. Yeah. So Gloria, for you, um, taking the qualification, any benefits there you've seen since? Mm -hmm. I decided to go for the postgrad, which I think was the best decision because uh, my work uh, covers different aspects of economic crime and I had the opportunity to, uh, you know, um, expand my knowledge on different things like cyber crime, mm -hmm. which I had never uh, studied before, or uh, fraud. Um, that was really, really great. In terms of work, um, uh, I, I, I use my knowledge all the time. That's really good And to hear. I go back to my materials when I have to. Excellent, so. excellent. So really broadening the knowledge. Yes. And Marta, now for you, um, MLRO, MLRO. Has the qualification helped you on that journey? Yeah, I, I was looking for quite some time to, to a qualification that was going to add value for someone experienced doing the job for, for a lot of time. And I think at the time I had around 15 years of experience. So which diploma and, and which qualification I'm going to do that I'm not going to lose time, but yes. it will add a lot of expertise. And for me, I think the great advantage was, first of all, the network. We still, we still have the group <laughs> ongoing, we, we have a trust environment, we advise each other and, and it's, it's such a, a refreshing thing to do and be comfortable to ask questions and discuss with other MLROs yeah. and other type of uh, experiences in the market. But for me there were two things, the quality of the teachers that were uh, tutoring the master classes yeah. and the type of value add that they added from a practical perspective. And then for me, something that really worked well was the research piece of the postgrad diploma. You, you make the time to do that research. Mm -hmm. You go deeper on each topic mm -hmm. and you have the, the freedom to select what are the topics you want to develop more. So that opportunity to save that time and to say, now I'm going to do this qualification, so I'm going to spend time on this was absolutely beneficial for, for mm -hmm. what I'm doing. And I still recommend 
uh, my team to, to seek the, the qualification. That's smart. So, so for all of you, you've taken the qualification. Is that the end of the game? That that's it, or <laughs> no? <laughs> it's never <Yeah>. an end. <laughs> <laughs> So this continuous learning piece um, is important on the practical level. Yeah, I mean, looking at sort of the longer term, what are the benefits do you think for companies to actually be investing in compliance training? It, it's about getting the knowledge out there because, y irrespective of what environment you work in, you, you are going to be working in a restricted area. So you're either going to be in money laundering or you'll mm -hmm. be in fraud or sanctions or bribing corruption. If you're in a smaller team, you may have to cover more of those areas. Mm -hmm. But if you've got to cover more areas, you, you can't go as deep. So trying to get that expertise across a broad spectrum is much harder than being an expert in a single discipline. Yeah. And this is where education and training and coaching all comes in. But it, it's that ability to move out of your day-to-day -day comfort zone, like Marta said, to dig deeper in, into an area that maybe you're not doing at work, but because you've got an opportunity to do some research, you can dig in and, and start to do some self-learning. Yeah. Yeah. And that's as important as being taught, I think. And I think the other thing is, um, and to your point, if you're doing sanctions, um, you should not do your specific area with in isolation of the whole yes. reality of financial crime. Things change, right? Things evolve. New risks appear. Emerging risks are different. And sometimes you need to adapt the yes. framework you already have in place. And you get to know these things interacting with other people. And you get to know new realities, new trends, new patterns. Because what we do is the same but in completely different organizations with different portfolios of customers and products so yeah. we complement each other when you start having those conversations so yes. i think it's absolutely fundamental to, so to continue i totally agree totally agree mm -hmm. with that i was going to say that because um the way things work now everything moves and changes so quickly like for example in the sanctions environment exactly. Every day there's something different happening, more guidance, different different regimes. Um, in terms of technology, our work is yes. di directly related to technology. We were just talking before about cyber yeah. crime, yeah. Um, uh, different types of firms offer offering services like payments, yes. um, e-money institutions. And it's very difficult to keep up yes. with, with everything unless you are directly taking some training, dedicating some time to research and things. That is interesting you're saying that because we found the short courses which we only started to release um, sort of around about a year ago and they've really taken off. Mm -hmm. And I think it is to the points you're raising, it's this role-based practical training that people want and also this self-learning where they can just yeah. do it within yeah. their own time frame. But I think, I think a very important point is also if not just from the perspective of, of the company itself um, gaining from their employees being well trained, yeah. but also from the perspective of the regulator. Because in my work as a skilled person, I see it all the time that one of the main reasons yeah. why a firm doesn't have effective controls is because of lack of training, lack of knowledge. Yeah, yeah that's a good um, point. Let, let me pick on Gloria's <laughs> point because I was going to refer, when you mentioned to the short courses that yes. we're, we're here talking about in the beginning about qualifications from a personal perspective, as Gloria was saying, and, and obviously the, the company will take value from that too. But there is something we should not underestimate, which is the difficulties on a day-to-day -day basis for the people that ag execute the controls, right? Yes. I'm, I'm an MLRO, but there's all these people in the company working that execute the controls. And what Gloria said takes to that point, which is you need to have feedback loops where you address weaknesses or issues that we have detected and you address immediately and those quick and, and short courses yes. allow precisely for that because there are practical topics yes. of imagine an analyst or a group of people that require specific training yes. on I don't know enhanced due diligence sanction screening yes. and it's a specific need and it's not a qualification that takes months no. that is going to target that it's a specific thing that is short yes. and can address the, the issue immediately so totally aligned with what Clara was saying. That is interesting because again we recently um, released a short course on suspicious activity reports and what's really coming home to us is that we're not just training compliance officers. You've got many people across the organisation mm -hmm. who genuinely need to understand that process 
And again, um, if you're doing it in a very practical, convenient way, um, you know, you're sort of making great progress. I suppose another aspect to it is that there's a sense of well-being as well. If you are being trained up, you feel good about yourself, don't you? And I think um, um, for you, MLRO, I mean, clearly that is important because if the regulator does come in to have a look, that's one of the first things they tend to look at, isn't it? What, yeah. what trainings yeah. happen? And, and it's part of your responsibilities to keep informed and to showcase what you have done to keep abreast of all the changes, right? It's, it's a world of change from a regulatory perspective, from trends and patterns. Yes. You need to be able to showcase what you have done. Yes. So it's extremely important to have that plan. And like Neil said, don't stop there, but have a continuous uh, you know, approach to what's the next thing that will bring value. Yes. And Neil, no, and I was just going to add yeah. to Marta's point there. It's we, we're all economic stroke financial crime experts, but you, you need to understand in, in my world, financial services, mm -hmm. that you have to understand the legislation, you have to understand the way payments works, you have to understand the political framework that you're working within. So it isn't just about the pure technical financial crime aspects. Yes. And then there's all the technology underpinning that. And you don't need to be an IT expert, but you need to at least understand what's going on so that you, you can be aware of what's possible and where there might be a problem yes. so that you can identify it and, and get some remediation in progress. I think you've made the point before, Neil, about the sort of the interrelation of all these different areas that you can't just sit in that silo and just focus on that one area. Silos are very dangerous. Um, because people are allowed to pay the customers charge. Yes. Are we allowed to pay the port charges? And it's all this stuff isn't just AML, it isn't just immigration, yeah. it's sanctions, it's bribery, corruption, fraud, and, it, and the whole thing is a big Venn diagram. It's not mm -hmm. silos. If, no. if you think of it as columns, it will not work. And th that's interesting because, um, again, we're recognising that uh, recently we issued a suite of mandatory training which is available across the organisation mm -hmm and sort of being really aware that there's quite a burden for individuals when you start counting up all the different areas of training they're having to do. Yeah. So it's again trying to come up with training that's relevant, engaging and effective in many ways, uh, which is sort of our mantra internally when we're sort of looking at new products. But yeah, no, that is interesting. And it's always easier to do whatever it is, whether it's your job or some training, if you're enjoying it and you're engaged. If it feels like a chore, like you're being forced into it and you don't really want to do it, whether that's your <laughs> your current role or some course that you've been put on by your employer, yeah. you won't get the best out of it, nor your employer. Um, well, amusingly, we've got one product uh, which has got an element of gamification in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard a story where one company was complaining because the employees were spending too much time on it. And they looked into it and it was because they were doing the course several mm -hmm. times because they were actually just enjoying the gamification element. <laughs> Uh, so it overcomes that, which is, yeah. is excellent. If I was going to ask you one more question, and I'll put this one to each of you, um, starting with Marta, if there was one practical tip um, you would share with our members, what would that be? It's fundamental to have a network. It's network. fundamental to have people yes. to whom you can have a conversation because the complexity of the topics in this area requires sometimes a conversation and then interaction and, and as Neil said there's several topics that are connected so my recommendation is build and enhance keep your network live yes. so you have trusted people so can you have a conversation yes. they could be peers they could be people that have more experience but but do rely on a trusted network yes. my tip would be uh, basically incorporate that into your everyday job Incorporate um, what you've learned. In yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. Make it like every day. It's not just about studying. It's just about making it practical. Mm -hmm. My tip would be to look at what it is you're putting yourself up for and then try to break that down into small amounts. So as an example, my train journey is about an hour and a half in the morning coming in. I'm in one seat, uh, so I don't have to get up and change. And that is absolutely perfect time for reading on either what new sanctions have come out or on some uh, academic stuff that I might be pursuing. Yeah. And it, it doesn't take anything out of my day because I'm on the train. Yeah. So I'm utilising what you could class as dead time productively. And if, if you can do that, you'll be really surprised at how much so-called dead time you've got during the day. 
And you don't have to utilise it all for academic learning or reading up on whatever it is, but rather than just staring out the window, I've seen that journey thousands of times, it hasn't really changed. I can do something new, different, uh, that's going to make me feel a better person. But back to my earlier point, it has to be something you're interested in because if you're trying to force yourself, it's yeah. just a chore. You're kind of investing in yourself in a way, aren't you? Mm. Yeah. There's one I remember you mentioned before, the, um, this triangle. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, the, so I, I think um, what we're all striving for is expertise. And if you think of expertise as requiring experience education and picture that as an equilateral triangle, to increase your expertise, you need to make that point higher. So you've got to make the base wider. So you've either got to have more education or more expertise, preferably both. And, and this is what you need to do is you keep expanding your expertise and if possible your experience, which um, sorry, your education and your experience, which will heighten your expertise. It may be that you've got to a position for that particular area where you think that is all I need. So f for me, the, the fraud triangle would be quite small. I only need a little bit of fraud knowledge just to understand it because I don't work in that area, but I just need to be able to understand it, it's got some touch points on sanctions. Mm -hmm. As long as I understand those, I know I need to go speak to someone who does know about fraud. Mm -hmm. And then, then you can start building loads of triangles. So you, you get, as we spoke about a year ago or so, you get your Toblerone starting to build up. Mm -hmm. And you, you will have your one big triangle, probably, yeah. where, you, where your expertise is bigger. Um, but you may have lots of these little triangles that complement the one big one that you have.